Hello everyone. Welcome to our second lecture on mechanics and materials. One, this is our second lecture on introduction to statics. And essentially we cover chapter three of the Beer Johnson book. Today we want to talk about rigid bodies and essentially the equivalent system of forces on rigid bodies. So last time we talked about statics of particles in 2D and 3D, we learned that statics essentially means equilibrium of bodies and statics equations can be written as sum of forces equals zero and sum of moments with respect to a point are equal zero. Now what we talked about was just the particles. And talking about particles means that all the forces are acting on the same point. Now, if you talk about a point, that means your free body diagram is always a point. And the consequence of that is that the balance of moments becomes equivalent to balance of forces. Because, for instance, if you think of, of a point, if these are the forces acting on, the, on a point, then... You can imagine with respect to a point itself, the moment would be zero. So none of these forces can apply a moment with respect to the point itself. And therefore, the balance equations of moments in terms of points, it's redundant. It doesn't give us any additional information. So for that reason, we want to talk about bodies this time. So if you want to talk about bodies or rigid bodies in particular, you can compare them with particles as such. If you think of a particle as a as a point with zero dimension, so it's a it's an infinitely small small point, a body has a size. Okay? So a rigid body is is not a point in that sense, and therefore many different forces could be acting on different parts of the body. If you think of a simple car, for instance, usually the forces that you have is a drag applied from, a, from the air. It's the weight of the car itself. It's also the reaction forces from the wheels, for instance, as shown here. So what we want to do today is to replace a given system of forces and moments acting on a body by an equivalent system. This is what we want to learn today. And once we have this equivalent system of forces, we can use that to write equilibrium next time. Okay? So today we don't talk about equilibrium specifically. Today we want to write a system of equivalent forces and once we know that then writing equilibrium is a fairly simple task. So the first thing we want to talk about today is the principle of transmissibility or that is essentially the fundamental idea behind equivalent forces. Now what, what does it say, the principle of trans, transmissibility? It basically says the effect of a force on a rigid body will not change if it is moved along its line of action. So let's see what that means. That means if you, if you think of a body, so this is, this is a, let's say, a three-dimensional body in space. Now think of a force F. And then an, equi an equal force F prime. Okay, so imagine that F and F prime are equal. And then again, remember, two forces are equal if they have the same magnitude and if they have the same dimension. So you can see these two forces, they are pointing in the same direction, they have the same magnitude, so they are equal. But also, these two point, these two forces are acting on the same line. We want to talk about this a little more in detail. In order to better understand that, you should also think about a third force. Let's say you think of a force F double prime. 
And imagine that F double prime has exactly the same magnitude and direction as the other forces. Therefore, according to our definition, F and of F double prime, they are also equal. So two forces are equal here. F is equal F prime is equal F double prime. However, you can see that F and F prime, they are acting on the same line, whereas F double prime is not acting on that line. That means F prime is equivalent to F and F prime and F double prime is not equivalent to F. So again, F prime is equivalent to F because it is equal to F and it is acting on the same line of action. F double prime is equal to F but it is not equivalent to F because it's not acting on the same line of action. So again, this is the principle of transmissibility, and here is the definition of two equal forces. So we know that two, two force ve vectors are equal if they have the same magnitude and the same direction. But this is not enough to be equivalent. Two forces are equal if they have the same magnitude and direction but if you want them to be equivalent then they should be equal but also they have they must have the same line of action okay so you should you should compare these these two slides being equal does not mean they are equi equivalent but being equivalent means they are also equal. So wh wh why is that an important topic why I'm talking about it so much? Uh, let me explain that by, by, by an example here. So for instance, think of two forces, F and F prime, acting on the same line of action on two points a and B. So we know F and F prime are equal. Here on the left, think of two forces F and F prime that are also equal because they have the same magnitude and direction and acting on two points A and B, but here now they are not on the same line of action. So if you think of the figure on the right, and you write the moment, the moment with respect to O would be OA, the vector OA, times vector F. The moment with respect to O for, from the force F prime, so we call that M prime with respect to O, would be the distance or the vector from O to B, so OB, times f prime exactly the same definition holds here so again the moment with respect to o from force f would be o a times f the moment with respect to o due to force f prime is o b cross product f prime so these two definitions are identical However, you can see that in this picture, the two moments, they are equal. So they are the same vectors. Whereas on the left, the two moments are no longer equal to each other. That is exactly the reason that equivalent forces are an important topic. So we we have talked about equal forces. Equal forces are also important, but equal forces, if they are shifted from one location to another location, they change their moment. They change the influence on the deformation of the material. Where, whereas equivalent forces, they can be moved along the line of action without changing the problem.
So basically, this is again the summary of what we have talked about. If two forces are equivalent, it means they are also equal. But if two forces are equal, it does not necessarily mean that they are equivalent. So after this, we want to talk about the moment of a force about a point. This is a concept you know from your previous knowledge on the, on the topic. And we just shortly mentioned that. If you want to talk about a moment of a force with respect to a point, it is always the cross product of the distance or of the vector. This is vector OA times the force itself. So vector OA times vector F, it gives you the moment with respect to O, but then this particular product or particular times operator it's it's called cross product so it's a it's a different product from a dot product also it is a vector so essentially the moment with respect to o is a vector and you can calculate the magnitude of that and if you want to think of a magnitude of that moment the magnitude of that moment is the magnitude of vector oa times magnitude of force f times sinus of the angle in between. And usually if you want to think of this, it you may you may want to think of a parallelogram like this. And then for instance if you think of these two vectors or these two sides as OA and F and then if this is the angle alpha, you can Im imagine that this formula is essentially giving you the area of that parallelogram. Also remember that uh, alpha is always between zero and 180 degree, and that means sinus is positive in this, in this case. And, and that is obvious because this is positive, this is positive, and this is positive. So this must be always a positive value. So just shortly talking about the vector product, because we just use that to define the moment with respect to a point. Vector product of two vectors is also called outer product or cross product. Okay, sometimes you can just show it by this times operator. So you can say U times V for, in, for instance. But in, to be more specific, you should always say whether it is vector product or not. And then vector product shall be compared with a scalar product between the two vectors. Now, scalar product is also referred to as inner product or dot product. So if you have two numbers, let's say 5 and 3, there is only one way of multiplying them. And it doesn't matter how you write that it's always five times three but if you are talking about two two vectors you cannot just say vector u times vector v you should say if that product is a scalar product or is it is a vector product now these two products are not identical obviously they do two, two very different things the first thing they do is that the result of a vector product of two vectors is a vector. So you multiply two vectors and you get a vector. Whereas for a scalar product or for a dot product, if you multiply two vectors, you, 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 you get a scalar value. You just get a number. Another property is that if you have two vectors and you multiply them using a scalar product, if you switch the order of the, of the two vectors, you get a minus sign. So P times Q is minus Q times P. Whereas when you talk about scalar product, P times Q is equal Q times P. So scalar product allows you to 
exchange the order of the vectors. Also, p.q scalar product, it, it has a simple definition that you, you may remember. It's the norm of or the magnitude of vector p, the magnitude of vector q times cosine of the angle between the two. And also here, you remember the angle is between 0 and 180. So essentially, this means that a dot product can, can give you a negative value. So it's a scalar value, but it could also be negative or positive. Now, to better understand the vector product of two vectors, think of the two vectors p and q. So if you have a vector p, vector q, and imagine that the angle between them is just 90 degree for, for now, then p times q, or more specifically, p cross product q is a vector that is orthogonal to p and is also perpendicular to q. And also the direction of that follows the so-called right hand rule. That means if you, if you have your index finger in the direction of P, and that is in the direction of the first one basically. So you put your index finger in the direction of the first vector, you turn, you turn it or you turn your hand towards the second one, then your thumb is pointing towards the cross product vector. If you do the same thing now with Q times P, so you put your index finger along Q in this direction, you turn it towards P, and then you would, you would see that your, your thumb would be pointing downwards. So that shows you that Q times P is the same vector as P times Q in the sense of magnitude, but the direction is exactly the opposite. So for that matter, you would say Q times P is minus P times Q. That's that. But also you can think that these two vectors P and Q that they were orthogonal here to each other for simplicity. So we assumed here that the, this angle was 90 degree. It doesn't have to be 90 degree. It could be also an angle theta and the same definition holds. So if you, if you think of P times Q, again, you put your index finger in the direction of P, you turn it towards Q, and then you end up with P times Q. Also, the norm of P times Q, or the magnitude of that, is again the magnitude of P times magnitude of Q times sinus of the angle in between. And obviously here the sinus is just, the sinus of 90 degree was one. So in this case, this would have been just PQ. So how to define the vector product more mathematically speaking? If you want to do that, it's essentially defined as such. So P times Q or P cross product Q, that would be a vector V and the vector V in 3D, it would have three components. So in the I, J, K direction basically, and then each line would be one of those components. So this would be Vx, this would be Vy, and this would be Vz. So you get three components, and that would be essentially your vector V. Now, how they are related to each other, it, it doesn't look very simple to memorize this, but this is defined as such. So the X component of vector P times Q is PYQZ minus PZQY. The Y component is PZQX minus PXQZ 
and then the z component is pxqy minus pyqx. Alternatively, you can think of this as the determinant of this matrix. So if you think of a matrix, 3x3 three three matrix, and then the first row are just i, j, k, the second row is px, py, pz, so it's just the vector p, and then the third row is just qx, qy, qz, so that's just the vector q. Then you can think of that, de that determinant as exactly what we just learned. So for instance, you know that in order to find the x component, you would multiply these two and then you subtract from this multiplication. So then you can see you get PYQZ minus PZQY, which is exactly what we had here. You think of J component is again the same thing. So for that, you would multiply PXQZ minus PZQX. But you remember that for the second one, you had a minus. So what you see here is the same thing, but with a minus sign. For the K, it's again the same thing. So you, you do exactly this. So you multiply PXQY minus PYQX. Alternatively, you can think of this clockwise rotation of components. So for instance, if you want the, the X component of vector V, you can always think of this clockwise rotation as the plus sign and then if it is counterclockwise as a minus sign so that means if you if you want to calculate this you are thinking about the x direction that would be yz that's in the clockwise direction so it's py qz minus pz qy okay so that's what you get here Again, if you want to do it for the y direction or for the in along j basically, it would be pz qx minus px qz. Okay, so again, remember the order matters. So it's p times q, and then the order of the indices, indices we, we, we can use it from this clockwise rotation. Now finally, if you want to talk about the z component, you can think of it the same way. So it would be, again, p times q, we know that, but then in this direction, it would be pxqy, because it's positive, and then minus pyqx. It doesn't matter exactly how you calculate this. In any case, you, you can calculate this vector product and I'm sure you have seen it before and you have learned it before what we want to learn after this is to calculate the moments of a force with, res with respect to an axis so this vector product we use for the to calculate the moment of a force with respect to a point what we want to do next is to calculate the moment of a force with respect to a given axis Okay, so far we learned how to calculate the moment of a force with respect to a point using the cross product. Now we want to know how to calculate the moment of a force with respect to an axis. In order to better understand that, maybe you can think of this example. If you have a force acting on a perimeter of a circle, then you can imagine that the, the angle between the force and the radius, the distance from the center, is 90 degrees so these are perpendicular to each other and if you calculate the moment of the force with respect to point O you get a moment vector that is exactly aligned with the axis passing through the circle and then that makes also a 90 degree so in this case you can imagine that this moment with respect to a point O could also be understood as the moment with respect to axis.
this vertical axis passing through. We want to do that. So basically, we want to generalize this idea for the cases that this moment, that the force is not necessarily perpendicular to R. So maybe the force is making an angle, but also even the force can be in a different plane. So it could have a vertical component. So we want to generalize this and see what would be the moment of a force with respect to a line, with respect to an axis. In this, in this case, you can imagine that you have a force F acting on a point O from the dis uh, at the distance R from, from the origin. Now, if you think about the moment MO, that is essentially R times F. But if you project that, so if you think of the orthogonal component on the, of that on the line OL, then you are talking about the moment with respect to an axis. I try to better explain that in, in this example or in the following slides. So for instance, think of it this way, that you have an axis OL, and then you have a force F acting on a point A. That force F has two components. One is on the same plane as the two points O and Q, and with the orthogonal vector of that plane to be QL. So there is that component that we call F2, and then there is this F1 component. You can imagine that F1 is producing a moment, but the, the moment from F1 is not going to be with respect to the OL axis. So we don't want that. More specifically, if you think about the example that I just mentioned, you can imagine that there is this green circle passing through A with the center axis to be QL, but it doesn't mean that the vector f is perpendicular to r so you can you can think of it this way the r2 the r2 vector the radius vector may create an angle with the f2 and that angle may not be 90 degree but if you find the orthogonal component of f2 maybe we can call it f2 orthogonal then this component times r would give you a moment with, which is exactly in line with the QL. That, that's the idea. We want to do that. So again, more mathematically speaking, this means that we want to project the moment with respect to O on the line OL, and then in order to do the projection on the line OL, we calculate the director of the OL line, and that is lambda, and maybe you want to say this is lambda OL. So we know what is the director. If you multiply the vector, the moment vector, using a scalar product to lambda, then you basically project MO to lambda, and that gives you MOL. And again, MOL itself is just a scalar value. It's not a vector anymore. It's not a vector because we know the line of action. We know the direction, basically. We just need the value. Now, if you replace MO by R times F, you get this. And using what we just learned for the dot product and cross product, you can write that as the determinant of this combination. So the first line is essentially lambda, the second line is R, and the third line is just F. Okay, so this triple product basically, or this mixed product can be understood or can be expressed in terms of this determinant. But also we can expand 
this relation a little using what we have in this picture. And that's what we want to do. So R, vector R itself, it has two components, R1 and R2. So you can write R as R1 plus R2. You can write F as F1 plus F2 as well. And if you expand this product, you get four terms, term one, two, three, four. And looking into them, you can see that, for instance, R1 times F1 is zero. You can, you can see that by just looking at the picture and because of their direction. So R1 and F1 are in the same direction, so basically their product is zero. Now, R1 times F2, they are perpendicular to lambda. Again, remember R1 is in the same direction as lambda, and then R1 times F2 gives us a vector which is perpendicular to that direction, okay? And basically because R1 times F2 is perpendicular to lambda, this dot product is zero. The same holds for R2 times F1. Again, you can imagine F1 and lambda are in the same direction. And the times the cross product between R2 and F1, it gives you a vector that is perpendicular to lambda and is perpendicular to F1, basically. And for that matter, this is also zero. So the only term that remains and is not zero is just the last term, and that's lambda dot R2 times F2. Long story short, you can say that this product, this projection, can be written as MOL equals lambda dot R2 times F2. But also, again, remember that picture that we had, or if, if you think of a top view of, of this picture, it is shown here. If you look at that, F2 itself may not necessarily be perpendicular to R2. So if you, if you had the orthogonal component of that, and let's call that F2 orthogonal, then you can imagine MOL, which, is, which has this definition and this number, is essentially nothing but the distance times that orthogonal component of the vector F2. Last thing we want to do is to look into this a little more carefully and by doing that, you can see that R2 times F2, or cross F2, it's a vector that is perpendicular to R2 and to F2. Now, because you know R2 and F2, they are on this plane, this means R2 times F2 would be a vector in this direction, or in this direction. It's going to be orthogonal to that plane. So it's basically parallel to lambda, but it may be in the same direction or in the, in the opposite direction. That means the projection of R2 times F2 on lambda or onto lambda is only giving you a sign. It doesn't change the direction. It only can give you a plus one or minus one because it's either exactly in the same direction as lambda, in that case, this just gives you R2 times F2, or it's in the opposite direction, in that case, it gives you minus that. So basically, it just calculates or it just gives you the scalar value of that and <clears throat> with a direction sign. But if you are only interested in the magnitude of that, moment, the magnitude is always the distance times the orthogonal component of the vector. 
So we know what the magnitude is. Let's say it's 10. We don't know if it is 10 in this direction or 10 in this direction. That is the only part that you can just see from this product. So maybe it comes minus 10, then you know it's, a, it's in the opposite direction. But, but the magnitude is always the same thing. So we want to understand this using an exercise together. And for that matter, just remember that the norm of that moment or the, the magnitude, the absolute value of that, again, this is a scalar value, but the absolute value of that is the same as the absolute value of R2 times F2. We will, we will just learn this by an exercise right now. So exercise one is similar to the problem 3.5 on page 10 of the Beer Johnson book. And this should help you to better understand the vectors in 3D and the, on the moments in 3D, whether with respect to a point or with respect to a line. Given is the cube here with the side dimension of A. So each side has the length A. And then a force P is applied on point F along FC. You are asked to calculate the moment of P about point A, about line AB, about line AG, so that's that diagonal line, and using the result of C, you are asked to calculate the perpendicular distance between AG and FC. We will come to that shortly. So in order to calculate the moment with respect to A, we, we just look at the picture. This is point A. The force P is applied at point F. And this is the force P. The distance between A and F is the vector AF. So if you have vector F AF, you have vector P, and you want to calculate the moment with respect to A, all you have to do is to just calculate the cross product of AF times P. And that's what we do here. So AF cross product P gives you gives you MA. Now what is AF? AF is having two components, one in the x direction and in the positive x direction. So you come towards the x direction as much as A, and that is the side of the cube. And then you go down in the y direction. So because you go down, you get a minus. Okay, so this is this is vector AF. So for this given coordinate system, vector AF is AI minus AJ, and then again minus is because you go downwards. You could also look at it this way, that vector AF is on the XY plane, so it should not have a Z component. Now, if you think of vector P, vector P is on, on this plane, and on that plane, it's essentially the, the same plane as the JK plane, or this is the plane that it does not have a X component. Now, this vector has two components, if that is vector P, the horizontal component here would be P cosinus of that angle. And then the vertical component would be P sinus of that angle. And if we call that angle alpha, that should be clear. But then again, you should see that the vertical component is coming upwards. And that is in the J direction. So that is plus. And the horizontal component, it's coming downwards, well, backwards if you want. So that would be in the minus 
k direction. And that angle is 45 degree. So basically you get p divided by square root of 2 times j, that's the y direction, minus, and then again it's minus because it goes backward in the k direction, p divided by square root of 2. And then again, remember maybe p divided by square root of 2 is just the same as p square root of 2 divided by 2. Okay, so now you have AF, you have P, you just put it into the system, you calculate the cross product. So A would be, AF would be A minus A0. P would be 0, P, P divided by square root of 2 minus P divided by square root of 2. If you do that, you get these three components. If you want, you can also write it like this. So that's part A. So remember this for the next part. Now in the next part, we are asked to calculate the moment with respect to the line AB. And remember we said that the moment with respect to the line AB is essentially the projection of the moment with respect to A on the director of the line AB. Now the director of the line AB is a unit vector in the direction of AB. And that is exactly the i. i is a unit vector in the same direction as ab from a to b. So lambda ab is just i. ma, we have it from the previous part. So all you have to do is to do this projection and then you, you know that i dot j is 0, for instance, and i dot k is 0. So you end up with just ap divided by square root of 2. So that's part B. Now part C, it asks you to calculate MAG. It's very similar to the previous part. All you have to do is to project MA on lambda AG. Basically the trick here is to calculate lambda AG. And if you remember, lambda ag is nothing but ag divided by the norm of ag, or the normalized vector ag, if you want. And you would do that by calculating the vector ag first. So vector ag is calculated using the coordinates of g minus coordinates of a. So if you think about this, the g is here. So the coordinates of g is just 1, 0, 0. And a is here, coordinates of a is 0, 1, 1. You do that, you calculate a g, and this would be your vector a g, the norm of that would be square root of 3, and then you just use these two, you calculate lambda a g, and you know what is also m a from part a, we know, we know that already, so this is lambda a g, this is M A. All you have to do is to just calculate the dot product, and that's pretty simple. You you do that, and then you get M A G. And then again, maybe here for the dot product, you remember, for instance, I dot I is just one, J dot J is one, K dot K is one. So basically, you just do the dot product. The last part, part D, is very interesting. It asks you to calculate the, the perpendicular distance between AG and FC. So this is your AG line, this is your FC line. The perpendicular distance would be a line here that is perpendicular to this, and it asks you basically to calculate that distance. Before doing that, we just do this test or this check, which helps us to proceed we will see that P is actually orthogonal to AG. How to check that? We calculate the dot product. Because P lambda AG is zero, you, you can say that P is orthogonal to AG. So now if you know two lines are orthogonal to each other, Basically, that distance between them would be the minimal distance. 
So we know that from the previous part. And we know that the line of action of P is just FC. So knowing that P and AG were perpendicular, we know that AG and FC are also perpendicular to each other. From part C, if you remember, we already calculated MAG. And then once you know what is MAG, you can also know or you can also calculate the absolute value of that. And you should, for that, maybe you want to remember what we just said, that the perpendicular distance times force, this gives you the moment along the line, but also it just gives you the positive value. For that matter, we need to calculate the absolute value. So we know what is the absolute value of MAG. It's AP divided by square root of 6. But also you know that would be essentially perpendicular distance times force itself. And comparing the two, you can calculate the perpendicular distance. This is not really complicated. We had we had that picture before that if you if you have for instance a circle and then you know what is the moment with respect to a line, then if this is the force and if this distance is perpendicular, you know that force times that distance it gives you exactly the moment with respect to the line. That's exactly what we did before. So the next topic that we would like to talk about is ideal moment. To better understand ideal moments, first we need to define a couple. So we call two forces a couple if they have the same magnitude and opposite directions. What does that mean? That means if you think of two forces, F and F prime, they have exactly the same magnitude and opposite direction, we call this a couple. So remember again, we would call two forces equal if they have the same direction and the same magnitude. We call them equivalent if they have the same direction, the same magnitude and the same line of action. So this would be equivalent. This is equal, and then this is a couple. And then using the term couple, we can define ideal moment. So the moment caused by a couple is called ideal moment. That should be clear. Now, I, I try to explain why it's important, why it's important to talk about something like ideal moment and why essentially having a couple is important. Think of two forces or a couple of force as such. Let's say if you think of the top view of two forces, it would always look like this. You would have two forces and you have a perpendicular distance between the two forces. So if the, if the plane of the two forces is here, that would be the top view of that plane. If you want to think about it in a more, let's say, three-dimensional three space, you can also think of it this way. Think of a force F acting on point A and the vector would be RA and then the force F prime or minus F acting on point B with the distance vector RB. This picture is exactly the same thing but we also show the distance RA minus RB which I explain why shortly. Now the two moments, they create a moment and we call that ideal moment and we want to calculate that. Now how do we do that? We 
calculate the moment of the two forces with respect to point O and we add them up. So the moment of force F with respect to O is just RA times F, cross product F. So that is M with respect to O due to moment F. The moment due to the force minus F is RB cross product minus F. Now, if you add them up, you get the total moment with respect to O, and that would be RA minus RB cross product F. If you look at this, now RA minus RB is this vector, is this green vector. According to the definition of the cross product, you can also then say, well, the magnitude of MO then is the absolute value of RA minus RB, or the magnitude of that, times the magnitude of F, times sinus of that angle, and that angle is this angle theta, basically. You can see this is the force F direction, and this is the angle theta. If you look at that, you can see that AB is this vector. So the norm of AB, the magnitude of AB, is essentially this line, this distance times sinus of theta is nothing but the perpendicular distance that we talk about. So essentially MO, M with respect to O, the total moment with respect to O, is just F times D. And then again, remember F is just a number, is a scalar value, it's maybe 5, D is a distance, and 2. So this is just 10, it's, it's, it's a number, it's a scalar value. But we know exactly its direction. Its direction is perpendicular to the plane that is spanned by the couple force. Now, why is that important? If you look at MO, and then again here it's shown as a vector, and then again you can see it's, it's perpendicular to that plane, we write it M with respect to O, and remember we, we always said that a moment should be written with respect to a point or about a point in space. But if you look at it now, you can see that you have just a force and you have a distance between the two force. So the coordinate system and the moment, the point itself, it doesn't matter. So this, is, this property is what makes this thing an ideal moment. So we call this an ideal moment because it is... It is a very unusual moment, it's a very unusual moment comparing to other moments. It does not depend on a point, it just depends on the distance between a couple force. So if you have a couple force and you have a distance between them, you get a moment, and that moment is coordinate free if you want, and that's why we call that ideal moment. This property basically tells you, well, if you have a moment, the ideal moment M, and if that is caused by two forces, and sometimes you can show it like this or like that, the moment is F times D. That means it doesn't matter how you show that moment. If you have a line or if you have a body, if you say it's the moment is applied in the center, or it's applied at the end, or it's applied half and half on two points, or any other combination, as long as the sum of the moment that you apply is the same thing, that's fine. So you can move the moment, basically, on the body. This photo from the book also shows a wrench, essentially, and I'm sure you have seen this example a lot. So when you want to open, uh, the, oh, sorry, when you want to turn something essentially and use a wrench, 
you usually apply couple whether you know it or not so this your right hand force usually is pushing down and uh, let's say your left hand force is equal is applying equal force pointing up so for instance if you call this f this would be f prime and the distance between the two would be d and then you can imagine that okay f so the norm of f times the distance d is basically the moment that you are applying and then again here the f prime is nothing but minus f so it's just the force f in the opposite direction okay so if you want to turn something usually you apply a moment you apply a couple force to do that and that's the so-called ideal moment so remember previously we talked about a resultant force so we said a resultant force is the vectorial sum of forces so we talked about something maybe we called it r you could say it was the sum of forces so you could replace a bunch of forces with their sum now if you think about this the resultant force is zero so there is no force it's just moment it's pure moment that's why we call it ideal moment but then it applies a moment so we can define similarly to resultant forces we can define a resultant moment so a resultant moment is the vectorial sum of moments and then again the emphasis here is that it's a vectorial sum it's still a vector but if you add them up you get just one vector and that vector does not know any coordinates you can then shift it to different points in your body that brings us to the next topic so basically we can always say that any system of forces and moment can be reduced or replaced by a resultant force and a resultant moment so this this is the important message here if you have a complex system of forces and moments you can always simplify that to just one force one single force one moment and once you do that, you can, you can now compare this with what we have done before. It, it's as if you are dealing with just the point. And once you know how to deal with the point, and we have learned that in the previous chapter, you can write the balance equations, the equilibrium equations, and, and solve your problems. So a little more on that. Essentially, would fall under the category statically equivalent system of forces so again we know that you can replace forces so we want to know how you can generate different systems or equivalent systems so for instance think of the system one so let's call this system one let's call this maybe system two system three these three systems they are equivalent but you can see that they have a different force and different moment applied to them if you think of one or case one you have just one single force applied now that one single force is causing a moment so it's causing a moment with respect to o prime it is causing a moment with respect to o but you can also shift that to point o so you can say well i want to shift my force to point o what would happen if this force was applied to point o well if this force was applied to point o then you need to you need to add a moment to the point o and this moment must be equal to the moment that the force f caused previously with respect to point o okay so you can do this shift but you should remember that if you want to shift the force you should always account for the amount of the moment that is subtracted or added to your system because of the shift of the force similarly you could imagine if the force was 
applied to point O prime, so you could replace the force here. But then, by moving the force from here to here, you are losing that much moment from the system, so you need to add a moment to the system too. I try to explain that in a few more examples. So the first example, so we have four cases essentially. We go through these four cases one by one. So let's say case one. Here is the case. If you think of a beam, okay, so it's, it's just a beam, and you have a force applied, a single force applied on that. Now, the single force is applied with the distance x from the left corner. That means this system, it feels the force downwards, but also it feels a moment with respect to point A. Now, if, if you move the force to point A, let's call this point A, on the left, if you move the force to point a or the corner point that means you are losing that much moment so basically by if you want to shift the force you can but then you need to add that much moment to the system so this system it is a force and a moment so there are two of them is equivalent to this system which is only one force okay so these two systems are equivalent if if you want to solve a problem, you solve them similarly, they have the same answer, but it could be that one of them is easier for your solution or it has some advantages. So you need to be able to replace a system with equivalent system, and that, that is essentially the idea. Now, if you have ideal moment, let's compare the two cases here. Remember here, we in the first example, we learned that if you have a force and you want to shift it, you need to add a moment to account for that moment difference in your system. Whereas if you have an ideal moment, if you remember from what we discussed on couples, because it's a couple force, the, the, the force, the resultant force is zero, you can shift the ideal moment to any other point and you are not losing anything. So these two systems are equivalent to. Now, also, you can think of a system slightly more complicated. So now you have a force and you have an ideal moment. So both of them in one point, and that's the point with distance x, let's say, from the corner A. Now, if you want to shift that to the corner, you can shift your moment to the corner A without losing anything. So you just shift the moment to the corner. But by shifting the force, so if the force is here, by, shift, by adding the force here, you need to also add this much moment to the system. Okay? So you need, you need to have the, the moment too. The force is missing in this picture, so you should have the force here, of course. So that's that. And basically, if you want to look at that, and if you want to think of the moment, then the total moment would be m minus fx. And then again, this is minus because you can see that if you think of the right-hand rule, this is counterclockwise, this is clockwise. So if you assume that this is your positive direction, that would be your negative direction. And then that's why you get a minus sign here. So according to this plus sign value. You can also think about the last one. If you think that now you have a force F and you want to just shift it to the right, that's fine. Again, you just shift your force, but then you add this much moment Fx to the system. And in this case, you do it counterclockwise. You should, you should compare this with your first case, which you applied the clockwise moment. So again, if you, if you look at this system, by shifting the force, you apply the moment, which was clockwise. 
in the last one by shifting the moment you apply a force that is counterclockwise. The second exercise of this lecture is similar to problem 3.7 of the Beer Johnson book on page 115. So you are given a system here. It's a, it's essentially a wheel and and a lever, if you want. And you are asked to replace the couple and force shown by an equivalent single force applied to the lever. So this is the lever. This is the force, and then we have the couple. You are asked to replace this by one single force. That's the first thing you're supposed to do. The second thing is determine the distance from the shaft to the point of application of the equivalent force. And this is this is the shaft essentially, but I mean it, it goes inside the plane if, if you want. So, so you can think that it's asking you basically if if you're replacing this by an equivalent force, what is this distance? So in the first part, it's act asking you to just replace it by that. And the second part, it asks you to calculate this distance. So in order to do that, we, we look first into the force itself. So we, we do it in two-step process. In, in step one, we transfer everything to O. We transfer everything to the shaft. So after we have transferred everything to the shaft, then we find the equivalent system in the second step. So for the first step, we have two, two smaller steps to do. We need to deal with the force and we need to deal with the couple itself. First, we deal with the force. We transfer the force to the shaft. So it's just transferring the force itself. But then by doing that, we must multiply this distance by the force and then add that much moment to the system. So this distance is 300 millimeters, so it's 0.3 meter. The angle is 60 degree. So the distance here is 0.3 times cosinus of 60. So this was the distance. So basically, force times that distance, it gives you the moment. This is the missing moment that we need to add. So this, what we have here, is equivalent to just this single force that we had. But also, we want to replace this couple by a moment. By doing that, you, you can just look at this one. So the distance of each of them is just 60 millimeter, so you have that. So this, this must be uh, 0.06, it's, it's 60 millimeter, but, but the answer is correct. So this is 2 times 200 times 0.06, but this is eventually correct. And if you, if you add them up, you get 84 Newton meters. Again, this distance, which must be 0 0.6, is essentially this 60 millimeter. So this is 60 millimeter. This one is 60 millimeter. And that's that. So you basically have your system. This is the first part. In the first part, we said, we want to transfer everything to the shaft, so we did. We, if you transfer everything to the shaft, you get a moment of 84 Newton meter counterclockwise, and you get a downward force of 400 Newton. Now we are looking for the equivalent system. Now the equivalent system is basically one single force 
and we don't know what's the distance of that single force, but we do know that that distance times cosinus of this angle, it gives us this perpendicular distance to the force, and then this distance times the force itself, it must give us exactly the 84 newton meter. So that's what we want to do. So the distance is OC, and let's say C is just an unknown point that we are looking for. The distance is OC times cosinus of 60 degree, and that is nothing but one half of OC. So you know that one half of OC times 400, it should give you the moment of 84. So the question is, what is OC? And then you know it's exactly 400. 20 millimeter. So basically, if this is 300 millimeter, this would be a little bit upper. It's it's somewhere here. So that is 420 millimeter. And if you think about it, that makes sense because this force is downwards, but then it let's say it applies a certain moment with respect to point O. But then the couple is also applying additional moment. So if you want to find an equivalent force you should you should do it further up such that it applies the same moment with respect to point o exercise 3 of this section is similar to problem 3.11 of the beer johnson book on page 133 so you are given a square so you can think of this square as being just the foundation of several columns and those columns are applying vertical forces on it this is kind of the idea so you have this square found foundation that support four forces acting on it and then again you can think of those forces as being columns on top of the found foundation you are asked to calculate the the magnitude and point of application of the resultant force. So the resultant force is applied on a certain point. If you don't know where that point is, you are, you are asked to calculate the force itself. So how much force is equivalent to all these four other forces, but also at which point the force is applied. This, this is what you are asked to do. So the force itself is very simple. It's essentially the sum of the forces that you have on the system. So you have 180 newton, 180 kilonewton, 36 kilonewton, 90 kilonewton, and 54 kilonewton. All of them downwards in the j direction. So all of them have minus minus sign, and all of them are in the y direction. So you get minus 100, uh, minus 360 kilonewton in the y direction or 316 kilonewton in the opposite of y direction downwards okay so that's that but then you need to calculate the location the position of that where is this applied in order to know that you need to make sure that this single force this resultant force gives you the same moment as these four forces together. So now you know it, it gives you the same amount of force, but you also need to get the same amount of moment. So for that matter, you need to calculate the resultant force, and the resultant force of that force must be equal, equal to the sum of the moments. Now, in order to, to calculate the sum of the moments, you, you multiply each of these by its corresponding distance. So essentially you have, let's say, uh, force one times its distance plus the distance of force two times force plus the distance of force three plus the distance of force four. So you would have these four components and also you know that the distances 
that we talk about R1, R2, R3, and R4, they are distances, R4 distances from origin. Oh. Okay, so you do that, you calculate those distances, you can you and you know the forces are downwards. It's it's a fairly fairly simple task. Uh, based on what you already know, but maybe you should also remember that all these forces are downwards, so they are in the y direction, and we know all the distances are, for instance, if you think of this distance or that distance or this distance, they are all in this in this plane. So if you multiply, if you calculate a cross product of them, the distance times that, you don't expect to get a component in the j direction or in the in the y direction okay so you do that and then you get your equivalent moment to be 324 in the i direction and 378 in the k direction. Now what does that mean? It means that the moment that you get from your equivalent force must be equal to this. Now your equivalent force is 360 downwards. So basically it, it would generate a moment with respect to the z-axis and that moment would be the distance xr times the force. So 360 times distance from the z-axis should be equal to the moment with respect to the z-axis. See, you have, you have a minus sign here, but we do not uh, need to worry about that because the minus sign essentially gives you the direction, whereas you can actually see if you, if you had this, you would already get the minus direction. So basically multiplying the distance by the force, it already gives you a moment like this, which is indeed in the minus of the in the opposite direction of the z-axis. So 360 times xr, and then xr is that orthogonal distance that you are looking for, it gives you 378. So from that you can calculate xr, and then again you do the same thing about the x-axis, whereas now you can see that the distance here times the force gives you the moment that is in the same direction as the x-axis, so it's a positive, so 360 times zr is 324. So if you do that, you can calculate xr and zr, and you get the answers for both of them. Exercise 4 is similar to the problem 3.8 of Beer Johnson book on page 130. In this exercise, the beam is subjected to, to the force shown. So you have a beam with the distance 4.8 meters. So the total distance you can you can calculate from this. You have you have this beam, you have a given system with the forces shown on the system, and then you are asked to calculate an equivalent force couple system at A. So we want to know what kind of force and couple we need to have at A to replace this. And then an equivalent force couple system at B. So what kind of force couple we need at B to have an equivalent system. And then you're asked to replace all of this with a single force. So let's say again, if it was a single force, where would I need to put that single force? That's what you want to do. And then again, remember we are only thinking of these forces for now. 
so the support reactions are not accounted for the support reactions are not a problem yet so in order to calculate the resultant force again we do exactly what we said the resultant force is the sum of the forces and all the forces are let's say in if you think of a three-dimensional coordinate system they are all in the y direction so some of them are in positive direction and some of them are in negative direction so you have 150 plus 100 these are upwards and then 600 250 they are downwards so minus 600 minus 250 you end up with minus 600 newton downwards so that's the equivalent force that's the resultant force now, what's the resultant moment? In order to calculate the resultant moment, for instance, with respect to A, you can, you can do that. So the resultant moment with respect to A would be the distance of this, and then you see it's turning it in this direction, and then the next force, so for if you think of this distance, it's going to turn it in the opposite direction, and then the last force is also turning it in this direction. So you need to choose one of them as as the plus direction if you assume this is your plus direction so counterclockwise is the plus direction you can do that or you can assume that clock clockwise is the plus direction either way it should work but you need to just justify one of them and, and go for it and here we we assume that it's Let's say the counterclockwise is the plus direction. So if you do that, and then again, I just mentioned that the, we assume counterclockwise is plus direction because you can imagine that if you had this z axis, and if you think about it, this, this would be kind of the rotation with respect to the z axis. So this is the distance from distance of the first force, and this is the force itself downwards. So this would be the moment of the first one. This is the same thing, the moment from the second one. And then again, you can see here, this is plus, this is minus. So it gives you a minus value. And if you, if you just look at it, it's going to turn this thing in the clockwise direction. So this gives you a clockwise rotation. That means it's minus. This gives you a counterclockwise rotation. That means it gives you a plus. And the last one gives you also a clockwise rotation. So it's a minus and then eventually the whole thing would be minus and that means it's the overall moment is also clockwise so basically if you just want to draw that you can you can now replace the whole thing by this system so you have one single force which is 600 newton downwards and you have one single moment which is 1880 newton meter but clockwise okay so that's that that's part a now for part b you want to do the same thing that we did previously but now you want to do it with respect to point b so you want to know what force and what moment i need to have at point b You can do exactly as we did in the previous part, in part A, but also you can just start with part A itself. So from part A, we know this is the system. So we know the system was, uh, or, or maybe it's here better like this. This is the system from part A. It was just the 600 Newton and 1880 clockwise. So what you can do is, to move that so we want to move the 600 towards the right end but then we need to add that much moment to the system and then you need to also add this 1880 we do exactly that so we shift the 1880 remember this is like an ideal moment now you can just shift it we just shift this we shift the 600, but then by doing that, you must also 
account for the moment of the 600 that you are you are missing by by doing this or you are ga gaining by doing this and that that would be the distance times that the 600 and the distance is 4.8 meter it's 600 and it's in this direction okay so you would you would add that much more and that is exactly 2880 coming to the right so this would be your system and then you can see now you get 2880 2, counterclockwise 1880 clockwise so this would be your system eventually okay so this is the equivalent system at point a this is from part a of the problem this is the equivalent system at point b so this is again this is point a this is point b they are equivalent so these two systems are equivalent and they are also equivalent to the big system that is shown here Now, in the last part, you are asked to find a point, let's say point C, in between, between A and B, at the distance X from A, maybe, that gives you the same answer, the same equivalent system. So, where is that, where that one single force should be applied such that it does exactly the same as the whole system of forces that we have here? Again, remember... The moment that we had here was 1880. So if you want to have that force, that means that force times the distance must give you exactly that 1880 that we had at point A. If you do that, you can get X as 3.3 meters. Okay, so again, this is from part A. What we want is to have that force to do exactly the same thing. So that gives you 3.13 meter. Alternatively, you can do it with respect to point B. So you can, for instance, think about this part. You know that your system, equivalent system at point B was like this. So you know the moment was 1000. So then you know this 600 times D, this should give you 1000. If you do that, then you get D equals 1.67. And obviously, if you add them up, X plus D is 4.8 meter. So it's, it's like a check. You can either do it with respect to A or with respect to B, but eventually, this is the distance. It's 3.13 meter from left and then 1.67 meter from right. Okay, that was all for today. We talked about equivalent system of forces and rigid bodies. This was, again, uh, basically the third chapter of the Beer Johnson book and our second lecture on introduction to statics.